Welcome to the dungeon. We're Captain Tommy Caloris of uh, Finn and Fowl, right? Finn and uh, Fowl Guide changed Service? My, no, you I changed, changed it? My, my branding. It's, okay. it's Floridian Guide Collective now. Fl- Floridian so. Guide Collective. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you offer, what, 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 is your, what is your guide service offer? Uh, I offer inshore fly fishing trips, inshore light tackle trips. Um, I'm starting to get into the the more of the brokering of hunt side of things. Um, I have a pretty decent list of outfitters across the country that I work with that are, I can book hunts for people and kind of get them dialed up on places that they might not know about. Um, hey, Doug. <laughs> um, so yeah, but primarily I, I would say I'm more known in the local circle for my tarpon fishing, I think. Okay. Fly fishing for tarpon. Yeah, fly fishing for tarpon. I think that's a, a passion that both of us both of us share. Indeed. We haven't gotten to spend any time on the boat together tarpon fishing, it's but coming. we're going to change that it's this coming. year. It's coming. Yep. Uh, so if we if we were big enough and we had a guy that could throw something on a screen for us, right now I'd, mm. I'd show everybody a map of Pinellas County. But but you're from Tarpon Springs. Born and raised. Uh, born and raised in Tarpon Springs. I was born and raised in Dunedin. We're both Floridians. Uh, both Floridians within you know 10 or 15 minutes of each other. Yep. And our shop kind of sits it's halfway between that indeed so uh it's there's a lot of people here but the fishing industry the fishing side of things is a pretty small Mm tight-knit group everyone Mm kind of knows everybody for better or for worse everybody knows everybody (laughs) no doubt uh so right now you're fishing uh well you're you're a professional guide uh but how did you get started in the Pinellas County, North Pinellas County area, um, falling in love with fishing, learning about fishing, um, those sorts of things? And what was growing up in Tarpon Springs like uh, for a kid that just wanted to run around and fish whenever he could? Yeah, it was um, it was beautiful, man. It was. I think I speak for everybody that grew up here. Uh, our our you know, a little West Central bubble here has exploded in the past 10 to 15 years. Um, growing here, growing up here was was really special. Um, as you said, I grew up in Tarpon Springs. It's a very small community, um, you know, built around a river. Um, I would say that river is responsible for you know, keeping me out of a lot of trouble fishing and just the outdoors in general kept me out of trouble a lot when I was younger. Um, I don't, I don't think there was necessarily a, a one moment that defined my passion or, you know, paved the way for, for my fishing. Um, but I would say my earliest memory of, of something that maybe jacked me up, uh, my family had a, a few acres just outside of town and had a bunch of ponds on it. We used to bass fish when I was a kid. My dad took me to Kmart, if that ages how long ago that was. There was a Kmart in Tarpon where the Walmart is now. Yep. And um, told me to buy anything I wanted for to go bass fishing that day. Well, of course, I bought like the most obnoxious looking frog lure that there was. Um, we went out to our local farm and I'm casting this thing all day and reeling it in as fast as I can. There's no, I, I think I might've been like seven years old, six years old. I bet I cast it a hundred times that day on my little Zebco. And I vividly remember this, and this it, I would say, yeah, this is pretty impactful now that I'm looking back on it. I'm reeling as fast as I can, and my dad says, stop, stop, stop. And he goes, real, 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 stop, stop, stop. And looking back on it, I didn't know why he was telling me to do that, but there was obviously a fish trying to eat my, my frog. Fish comes up, explodes on my frog, um, pretty close to the dock, and turns out to be like, an, I think it's eight pounds, like six ounces. That was my first official fish that I caught by myself. So that one definitely had an impact. Um, And it kind of just spun off from there. Um, You know, like I said, growing up in in that river corridor, the Anklet River corridor, wasn't allowed to leave the river um, when I got my first boat. So, you know, turned into a river rat of sorts, along with a, uh, a pretty good group of guys in town and just started learning anything and everything we could there was no internet you know it was basically books and your elders teaching you you know throughout my life i really didn't get into reading books until i was in my teens but you know as a kid you know you're just throwing everything up against the wall and seeing what sticks and you're doing what your elders tell you what works or they show you or um so i would say that definitely paved the way and and kind of you know started my passion for fishing um 
and just the outdoors in general. Yeah, I mean, because you look at the area on a map of Tarpon Springs, mm-hmm. and it really is built around yeah. the Anklote River. The whole town is built around the water. Um, yeah. If you drive through Tarpon, even back into the residential areas, I mean, it's it's water. There's it's water all everywhere. water, and they, people just built houses around the water. Yeah, there's water everywhere, yeah. and it and it goes inland a lot. It goes inland for, very for far. Long it goes it even stretches up into Land of Lakes. Um, uh, you know, across the Veterans Expressway into the Bexleys Farm. Um, it, it's the Anklet River is very, 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 very big. It, yeah. it goes way back in inland. Yeah. So, so growing up, running around, trying to figure out. Mm-hmm. You know, I was remember getting getting my homework done as quick as I could, mm-hmm. so I could, you know, go fishing. Whether it no was doubt. the pond at the end of the street that when I started it. driving, you know what that was like to yep. you know dr- go drive, and it opened up a whole new whole new world and then you get a boat and you know uh we had a, a john boat a 14 yeah. foot alumacraft yeah. and that was similar to us we would fish lake tarpon and then you know we weren't allowed to leave the intercoastal mm-hmm. our intercoastal even though it's only 10 miles south our yeah. intercoastal is a lot smaller in dunedin yeah. so we we're able to go out but not really go under the dunedin causeway just no. caladesi and back had and barriers for sure yeah and that's and that's you know it's it's funny how you can fish the same water your whole life, but it's it always changes, and it's it always so always different. You're always trying new stuff. So even today, um, I still fish the river intimately, like I did when I was a kid, and it's forever evolving. Uh, yeah. You know, if we have a big hurricane or we have a super big rainy season that you know dumps a bunch of fresh water into the river, and it might who knows? I mean. The city's talking about dredging our river right now, so that could change the hydrology and, and the way the water moves through our river. And that could, you know, spots that I know work in our river, they might not work anymore, or spots that, you know, it, it, it's constantly evolving. It never stops. Yeah, and we'll talk more about the difference in the fishery sure. coming up. But, sure. but what I always thought is how amazing it is that, you know, when you fish somewhere every day, mm-hmm. you don't notice the differences as much as when you leave yeah. and you come back yeah and you know knowing so the knowledge of growing up somewhere and you know knowing that place mm-hmm. fe- feeling like home mm-hmm. it allows you when there are changes that happen you can adapt more quickly or when For you sure. know that the weather is going to be this the winds out of this direction or uh, that it allows you to to adjust for, so for your business mm-hmm. it it helps a lot because you know it lets you you know it lets you like really give your anglers uh, uh, the best chance no matter what the conditions sure. are but that's something that you know you can't just learn that's something that growing up there you have to go out and do it and experience it yeah and this i, I could uh, this could spiral into a huge conversation but I, I don't know if we want to go that direction but <laughs> you you know when you grow up in an area like you're saying and you're watching something change and evolve over time and a spot changes or a hurricane comes through and blows this sandbar bigger or makes it smaller or whatever when you watch that happen, like you said, you can you're, you're giving your angler, whoever steps on your bow, no matter what, because uh, as you know, weather's not always going to be the best, and it's not going to be. You, you could write a script on what you want to do the next day, and you wake up the next morning, and the wind's ten knots harder than a different direction than they said it was going to be. If you haven't fished there your whole life, you're gonna you're gonna be like, well. My plan A and B and C is now gone. I don't have a plan D or I, I, where do I go? So, yeah, I would say a lifetime of growing up in the, in a fishery, you know, gives you that ability to do that, to, you know, switch gears on the fly, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So let's let's transition a little bit. So you kid grown up yep. around the river, yep. fishing for fun. Yep. Going to school, getting in trouble, doing the thing that kids do. Going to school, doing the kids, you know, doing everything kids do, playing a little bit of sports, yeah. um, you know, but fishing and hunting definitely superseded anything. Um, graduated high school, um, tried to go to college for about a year and a half. Um, just wasn't my thing. My parents got a divorce right before I graduated, and I just, I kind of dove head into fishing and Oh man, I would say about a year or two out of high school, um, I got an opportunity through a family friend who owned a, a, a private sport fish boat. Um, I got an opportunity to go work with them. Um, they had a they had a, a an opening come up. They were on their way back from Mexico. He calls me, tells me to come down to the Keys. Long story short, I kind of go down that avenue, which 
you know, on the west coast of Florida, there's really not a lot of private sport fish boats. It's not an offshore fishing destination. Um, so it was kind of a, a an avenue that I always had interest in, but I never really had an opportunity to do it. So when the opportunity presented itself, I kind of dove all in. Um, you know, went back and forth maybe for a year there on like, do I, is this something I want to go with or, you know, what do I want to do here? You know what I mean? Do I want to go down this avenue? All my friends were in college and, you know, the economy by now I'm 21, 22 years old, the economy, you know, the dive of 08 there starting to happen. And I'm, you know, okay, yeah, I'm going to do this. And I went down that road for 10 or 12 years, um, working on private boats. Um, and man, I saw some incredible stuff. I traveled to some really incredible places and, I learned a pile um, <laughs> at the time I didn't know would translate into my inshore fishing at home or my fly fishing game anywhere for that matter. Um, but that definitely paved the way into, you know, develop me, developing me as an angler and as a, a guide um, in the industry. So, yeah. So, so the offshore um, private sport fish boats, mm -hmm. uh, you're fishing. We, you, we talked a little bit before this, you're fishing tournaments, fishing all over the world. Yep. Uh, and primarily fishing turn, like f fishing, mostly tournament fishing, for billfish, uh, mostly primarily. it was all billfish. Okay. So the first couple of years, um, I worked for a guy who would just kind of fun fish and we would fish the old salt loop tournament. Um, every year and that was the only tournament we would fish but when i worked for that guy we we, we traveled to uh the northern gulf we did missus we did the excuse me louisiana we stayed in louisiana fished out of sandestin um biloxi orange beach alabama fishing the oil rigs and all that stuff so i kind of cut my teeth um learning how to build fish in the gulf which was cool i thought that was cool when i was doing it because i'm you know obviously from the gulf coast and mm -hmm. learning how to build fish in the gulf was was really neat and then it's not something many people do around no here. i mean there's a you know there's a handful of people from i'll say the northern pinellas corridor down to i'll just call it fort myers that you know they do fish what what is known as the loop current um yeah. the gulf stream loops into the gulf um, and there's an area due west of like Boca Grande called the steps. Um, the continental shelf just drops off there real good. And we use satellite shots to look at the water and all that. But yeah, not a lot of people are doing it on the West coast. And I felt very fortunate to have a job that I was doing that. Um, and then as the program grew and the owner grew, um, we started building boats, um, built several Vikings with him, which that, that was an experience in itself that I, I, I'm infatuated with boats. I love boats. I love skiffs. I love big boats. So having the ability and the, the opportunity to go build a boat uh, for this gentleman was, it was, it was truly an honor to do that. Um, but going back to, to the bill fishing, once we started fishing out here and kind of honing our team, so to speak, um, you know, we started broadening our horizons. We, then we, then we started stretching out. We went to St. Thomas, the Bahamas, um, Eventually, and I'm talking over the course of 10 years here, um, you know, we started fishing Bermuda, Ocean City, Maryland, Cape May, New Jersey, all over the Gulf, like I said, um, Mexico. Um, and then eventually he, he bought a place in Costa Rica and, and we started fishing in Costa Rica out of Los Sueños. Um, and that's when the tournament fishing really took off is when we started stretching out to, to all these places. Ocean City, Maryland has the White Marlin Open, um, you know, anywhere from a three and a half to five million dollar purse. And that was like, I would say that was my first real big tournament. I had fished some some tournaments in the Bahamas that were respectable tournaments if you want them. But, you know, the White Marlin Open is like the Super Bowl. You're talking about four or five hundred boats all competing for a, a multi million dollar purse. So that's kind of where I learned how to dredge fish and dead bait troll. Um, and really, I would say that's where I learned, started to learn my tackle, really perfecting all of my tackle and knots and learning how to fight fish, uh, learning how to kill fish, um, learning how to take care of a boat, certainly. Um, that, that's all up there. You're, you're talking about a when we would leave for Marlin season, let's just say on a normal year, we would leave in June to go to Bermuda. Um, we would fish Bermuda from the end of June, basically all of July fished three tournaments in Bermuda, 
load the boat up the, after the last tournament, maybe the day of the tournament ending, we would load the boat up, maybe leave that night. We did that a couple of times and then go to Ocean City, maybe have a week in between tournaments there, reset everything, new line on everything, you know, and we're back at it. We're fishing again. And when you say load the boat, you mean driving the boat from Bermuda yes. up the East Coast of the United States to yes. Ocean City, New Jersey. I have taken a boat. In Maryland. It, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, I have taken a boat a, a lot of places um, leaving out of the Anklo River. I have left out of the Anklo River and taken a boat all the way to Cape May, New Jersey and back, stopping at several places along the way, the Keys, the Bahamas, Bermuda, you know, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, Moorhead City, Virginia Beach, all up and down the eastern seaboard you, you know you have to obviously when you're traveling you have to stop and get fuel and stuff like that um but yeah load the boat and drive from bermuda straight to ocean city um we did that i think i fished two or three seasons in, in ocean city or in bermuda i fished seven seasons in ocean city um yeah because well you hear people say all the time like oh i fish every day i live on the water mm -hmm. well no you still load the boat up and yeah. take it home yeah. and sleep in your bed yeah. and and sit on the couch or whatever else but you were like literally living on living the water. on the boat living um, on the boat you know when the boat would pull out of its slip and that's that's the job i that's mean if you're, if you're a captain or you're a mate on a on a private or a charter boat for that matter charter boats travel too that's home that's your home you better take care of it it has you know your bathroom your i mean when i say this we the, the boat we stayed on was very nice i mean everybody knows I, i'm assuming a lot of people know what a viking is i mean yeah but in over the period of months months i don't care what boat you're on it gets old it gets small it and does. it feels small For and it gets sure. old and the your, roo your and, roommate you better yeah. like the guys you're rooming with mike julian i love you <laughs> um yeah you, you you get to know all the people on the boat very well. And, you know, the owner's on the boat with you in most cases. Sometimes he would stay with us. Sometimes he wouldn't. He'd rent a house or he'd stay somewhere else. If He'd bring up another one of his boats up there and stay on another boat. Um, but in a lot of cases, you better like the guys you're with because not only are you working with them on deck or fishing or traveling, you're living with them. You're eating dinner with them. You're going to have your social time with them. Like, And it's funny, you know, you look at the sport fishing industry and it's, you know, just in America, let's talk about just American boats. It's a, there's thousands of owners, but it's a very small group of guys. You know, you, you'd go to Bermuda and there's, let's say there's a hundred boats fishing the triple crown. Everybody picks up and we all go to ocean city and we all stay on the same dock again. So you start to, you meet these people and you know, as you travel this circuit, it's the same people everywhere you go. So you kind of have like this dock family that you start to know these people from different parts of the world and the country. Um, you know, I met guys from, from Caraco, uh, Nick Bovel, he's from uh, uh, the Cayman Islands. Um, you, you meet people from all over the world and you start to become friends with all these people. You meet some incredible people. I'm, I'm definitely thankful for all that. Um, well, a lot of networking too. A lot and of networking, you start to, you start to realize that there's so much more out there in that industry rather than just being a mate or being a captain. Um, you know, that that's how mates and captains turn into brokers or, you know, next thing you know, they're, they don't want to be a sport fishing captain anymore. They're driving a yacht, a 250 foot yacht for somebody in Greece or Italy or wherever um, at the, at the Monaco show or something that happens a lot in the industry. Um, it's a very demanding industry. Uh, you're dealing with people who, you know your owners are obviously wealthy people and they they this is their their pleasure yeah. most of them are using this as a getaway um and you have to get along with your owners you have to be a people person everything is attention to detail from taking care of the boat if you take care of the boat the boat's going to take care of you that's rule number one the fishing is about 10 percent of that job taking care of the boat is i would say 90 percent of the job but Taking care of the boat is some fishing stuff too. Your outriggers, your electronics, your freezers to keep all your bait in, how you're storing all your tackle. It's a lot of moving parts. A lot of moving it's a parts. I mean, it's a it's a machine that you have to keep running, and it's your main. You know, rods and reels can be replaced pretty rods quickly. Rods and reels can be replaced. But and they a, can be serviced. a boat, a boat right. can't when you're a out there. A boat cannot. So. You know, you run it. You, you throw a belt on a generator. You better have a different. You better have a new belt to go down there and fix it. And it's going to be 500 degrees, and you're going to have to do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it just. <clears throat> It, it's amazing to me how fishing can make the world or i guess at least a part of the world mm -hmm. shrink mm -hmm. uh Very much. you know you get to know people from mm -hmm. this i know that i know you know i know a guy from here and a guy from mm -hmm. there and it 
especially the pelagic fish oh, yeah. that are traveling the world themselves you and you guys are chasing them you gotta follow you know there's people from everywhere that are chasing them and you get to meet people from everywhere which which is unique because i feel like on the inshore side of things yeah you can go catch bonefish all over the world sure. you can go catch tarpon all over the world you can go catch it's more permit. location specific it's more, in the but, inshore but game. it's but it's more location specific it's yeah. like yeah this guy's a keys guy this guy's a, a west central florida this guy click of guys here fishes yeah. together and they're in south florida yeah, this, this is the glades is, guy right and right. it's kind of very much it's a, to travel to fish for you it might be a, a four-hour drive to where that's nothing in the in the offshore game i mean I it's mean, there, yeah of course there's boats from everywhere sure so. there, i mean when i say everywhere i mean like everywhere there's yeah. boats from there would be boats from texas and bermuda yeah like that's that's a that's a poke you know what i mean like it's a long haul that's a long it's haul. a lot of fuel a lot of fuel. You better place pretty. You better have a, a really uh, a, a really good owner. You better place well in the tournament. Yeah, exactly. Right. We don't talk about the fuel burn. That's one thing we don't talk about. <laughs> but um, but when you're talking about these mar these marlin tournaments, mm -hmm. I mean these it's millions of dollars that's yep. on the line. Yep. That that you have guys who truly are not necessarily doing it for the money. They're doing it for the love of what they're doing. But the guys that are working the boat, that that money means a lot to you guys oh, certainly, too certainly because that's that's part of i'm sure how you got compensated was how you guys did in the tournament no doubt so. we um you know depending on your owner and what kind of agreement you have with your owner it could be it could be 20 percent off the top 10 percent, 5 percent. however he wants to pay you that's none of my business how people get paid um that's certainly a motivator right i mean you know if you're talking <laughs> Let's just let's just round number it. If you're talking about a million bucks, yeah, and you get ten percent off the top, it's a and lot. you're a captain, yeah, and your owner's willing to hand you a hundred grand, yeah, that's and a place to live. It's substantial. You and know what I mean? Yeah, it's on a boat, but it's right. a place to live for a few months out of the right, year. Right, exactly. So, so well, that's that's. But I still would probably guess that when you guys are in a tournament mm -hmm. and you have a fish on the line, mm -hmm. okay, like, mm -hmm. you're, and you see it jump, and you're like, mm -hmm. this could. This, this get the gaffs. Well, th this fish could place us sure. pretty high or win the tournament. Yep. I would assume that the money is not what's at the forefront. It's the competition. It's the it's, competition. it's winning. It, it's still yeah. you know it's still that measuring contest no of doubt. like I'm better than you. That is the driving Look, force when of the competition. You're on sea dock in Ocean yeah. City, and there's you know 70 boats on that dock. And you have a white marlin that you just you guys just gaffed and you put in the boat and it might be worth four million bucks. You're not really yeah, you're thinking about the money once it's in the boat, but like you're saying, when it's on the line, it's like, all right, I'm ready to roll back in here. Going to the scales is like going to the Super Bowl at the White Marlin Open. But a hundred percent what you're saying. It's it's certainly a a, a a motivator, just a competition aspect of it. You want to win. I mean, if you don't have a, a competitive drive, then you don't need to be fishing. I mean, just... Well, and the reason that I said that is because so now your business, what you do, mm -hmm. okay? So if I if if I was a customer from you know Kansas mm -hmm. and I wanted to book you for the day, mm -hmm. okay? And you have your daily rate, and you're going to try and provide me with the best experience that you can. Mm -hmm. But if I don't catch a fish. Mm -hmm. When we're tarpon fishing, it's just it's part of the game. I mean, it's just part of what's understood. So it, it's not like I have to get this guy a fish or I don't get paid. What drives you is the ex being excellent. What drives you is being the best. What drives you yes. is that it's not just a financial game. Yes, it's it it has to be that to do what you do. Hundred percent. Because if not, you can just become complacent. You're like, well, I'm getting paid no matter what. So I'm gonna mail it in and yeah. I'm getting a check, and that's yeah. just the way it is. Like. There's, you're a hundred percent accurate on that, Alex. There's, when I get on the boat in the morning with a guy that I just met from Kansas, and let's say I booked him for two days, and he, let's say he does know how to cast. Let's no. say he's, let's say he's a decent angler and he can get it there, and he's doing some of the stuff I'm asking him to do. Maybe he gets a couple bites. Maybe he just has bad luck and he just doesn't get one to bite, or who knows. I'm gonna do everything in my power. To, to not get complacent and mail it in and just take that guy's money. I'm going from daylight to dark until I feel like I've exhausted myself and I feel like I've exhausted my angler and my resources to try and get this guy the best experience possible. I'm not putting him in the boat and I'm not just pushing around at a spot going, 
yeah, well, they're just not here today. We're just going to have to suck it up and just sit here for eight hours and stare at each other. No, 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 no. Or even worse, if I know it's going to suck, let's say it blows northwest 20 and we get a late season front in May and the water muds up. And I know we literally have no shot at catching the tarpon. I'm calling the guy the night before and I'm telling him, this is the scenario. This is what we got. This is the hand that we're dealt. Here's what we can do. Here are some options. The guy just flew here from Kansas. I'm not going to tell him to go sit in a hotel room. No. So, uh, all right, man, you just flew here from Kansas. Let's go see if we can, you know, make a day out of something. Yeah, I'm figure gonna something him, out. Yeah. Something. We're going to figure something out. But I'm not going to take him tarpon fishing. Yeah. Whereas I see guides and I know people that, you know, if that scenario, they, those cards lay out in front of them, they're grabbing that guy. They're putting him on the boat. They're going out there in muddy almost cussed they're going out there in muddy water and they're pushing the guy around for eight hours a day knowing that they're not going to catch a fish just to get paid that's the guy that's being complacent yeah so i'm going to grab that guy and i'm going to say hey man i might not charge you a full day rate of tarpon fishing let's just go do some inshore stuff maybe i'll take him you know somewhere in the river and we'll go where it's protected where the wind's not blowing and we can we'll make a day out of something we're going to do something to where I feel like that guy had a great experience on his day. Maybe he learned some stuff. That's one of the biggest things that I've noticed in my guiding career is that people enjoy learning. They want to leave with a bit of knowledge for themselves. They have to have that. What, what I think when I hear that about making sure that you're upfront, honest with the customer, mm -hmm. this is the hand that we're dealt, mm -hmm. the weather is something that we can't control, so you're going to control what you can. but what that does in my thought and same thing here, like in the shop, like mm -hmm. there's people that come in all the time. Maybe it's the same guy from Kansas mm -hmm. who doesn't know what he needs, doesn't know what he's looking for. And you can sell him a bunch of stuff he doesn't need. And you can sell him a bunch of stuff that he doesn't, no but, doubt. but he's going to figure that out Oh yeah, and he's never going to come back. He's never coming back. And you know, if, if you're out there, you can tell, like I've been on the boat with people before, whether it's a guide trip or just a buddy trip or whatever else. Sure. There's that part of the day where you can just kind of feel like, all right, one of us has given up. Like sure. it's over. like the day's over. The like, day's over. Your like, angler's lost yeah. interest. He's yeah. And that goes back to what I'm saying about being complacent or knowing that you're not gonna give this guy a shot. Like yeah. if if you put him on the bow and okay, if you and I go fishing, Alex, and I say it's late season, water's muddy. It's been raining like crazy for four days. We might get like five shots, but we might get a bite. Yeah. You're probably going to be in. Yeah, I'm in. But the guy from Kansas. He needs pro he needs more than five shots. The guy to needs get the like 25 out. or 30 yeah. shots. To, to, to I need more than five shots to get the yeah, knee jitters sure. out. I can just exactly. it out Exactly. So I can't, yeah. I can't go out there and expect to get five shots on a cloudy day with muddy yeah. water and expect this guy to capitalize. Yeah. So what you're saying about somebody giving up or that, that, that mood swing on the boat, when that when that happens, he's not coming back. No, he's he's done. You can tell. You can tell because if you just start pulling down, uh, flat, even if even if it's not tarpon, right? Say it's redfish, right. say it's snook, and he points out five fish in a row because you're not paying attention. You're mm -hmm. just aimlessly pushing down mm -hmm. the thing to get mm -hmm. to three o'clock. Right. He know. I mean, he, he knows. knows that. He knows. And and a lot of these guys have fished with people before, and and so I think that putting in that extra that organic, Effort. same thing here, like at the shop. Like being honest with people mm -hmm. like you don't like you're here for a week mm -hmm. okay you want to enjoy your time here whether mm -hmm. it's booking a guide whether it's coming in and 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 buying a setup so you can go do what you want to do like right. yeah there's are am i nervous about someone else being here fishing not really because the what we do is with a, mm -hmm. especially with a fly rod what mm -hmm. we do is so specialized that no doubt. you need a boat to really to be successful to get to the spots that you need to get to but also, it's a tough, and that's that's a tough game. And it's very difficult. We tell people here now that, and we'll get into some of the changes in the sure. in the fishery, but um, but it's not weird for one. We just did it the other day. Mm -hmm. I mean, to go out and not catch something because the fish don't cooperate. It happens because the sun, the visibility is bad because of the wind. Whatever. Blowing further. It's, Look. It can be the perfect day, and it's the perfect fish and with the perfect fly, and he just decides, I'm going to act like a bonefish or a permit, and I'm just not going to eat today. Sure. And to me, the driving force is that that makes it that much more rewarding when it when does. It all, when it when all you does connect all the, the dots. But it also makes me 
want to be on I want to be honest with people when they come in here and and our guys here are mm -hmm. it's not easy like no. I can't just say like throw this lure at the spot and you're gonna go catch a fish and like, it doesn't work that that's way. that's a in tarpon in tarpon fishing in that space I don't think it's a misconception but I think people have this idea of like because they see all the media on social media and they they see these really cool reels that guys make and let's say they're traveling maybe they're not traveling maybe they're somebody local and they're just getting into it they have this idea that if i go out and i see tarpon i should just be able to close the gap and get this done whether i'm doing it by myself or i have a guide pushing me on the back of the boat for whatever reason people have this idea that when they do book a guide that he is you know he's going to have all the answers and in most cases he should have all the answers but for you to execute them, how and he should be telling you whatever he tells you today, he should tell you the exact same thing and almost the exact same words a year from now. And whether or not you are your ability to execute what he's telling you to do, that is where you're going to close the distance and where you're going to capitalize on your opportunity that he's giving you. That being said, going back, let me touch back one on one thing you were talking about. You were talking about effort and and not getting complacent in your day. Everybody has bad days. Yeah, I've had terrible days on the water. Whether I make a bad decision on when to be at this spot, or maybe I pick up and run because I see a crack of sunshine ten miles away or five miles away, and I get up there and the crack of sunshine closes, and then now there's sunshine where I was, and I run back and there's somebody there. Whatever it is. The, the guy that's on the boat with you, whether he's you're a first time client or he's somebody that you fish for 10 years, if you put a maximum effort in and he sees that a real effort, push your boat hard, get off your trolling motor, really, really try to, to show that guy that you're trying, you're, you're exhausted. You're, 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 you're mad too. Like you're I'm pissed off too. at him. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah. pissed off at him. I want to win. Yeah. I want to win just like he does. Yep. So more times than not, if I've had a bad day, and it always seems to be when I'm having a bad day, I'm, I'm, I'm trying my ass off, right? Some, something's happened to where, I, like I said, I've made a bad call or the weather, something's happened. When I get back to the ramp, if I've had a bad day, and let's say we, we had, let's just say we had 15 shots, which is a decent day, but that's not a good day, like as far as shot numbers, in my opinion. I feel like I need more than that for my guy. And I get back to the ramp and he feels like, and I can tell he feels like, I, you know, we didn't deliver that day as a team. Maybe it was me. But if he saw that I exhausted myself and exhausted my resources and really tried for him, they will tell you. They will be back. I promise you that guy will be back. Yeah. To anybody who's starting to guide, any young guides out there, don't mail it in. Don't get complacent and just say, let me get to 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock. Don't, but don't even put your guys on a clock. Pick your guys up, take them fishing, and go at, get after it, man. Go fishing like you would if you were by yourself. If you were by yourself, you're not going on a clock. No. You're going until you come home and you're happy about your day. Yeah. That's At least that's how I fish. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people should fish like that. And if everybody do, if every if every guy did that, there wouldn't be these clients that, that you know, I, I take people fishing. Man, I've been trying to catch a tarpon for... 10 years I've booked guides all over the state and I'm sure he had some good guides in there and I'm sure he had some bad guides in there but like a, a guy shouldn't have to try for 10 years to catch a tarpon on fly <laughs> he shouldn't I mean it's just it, you know but that that could be argued and that's that's opinion but maybe you can cut that out <laughs> um but that's just how I feel about it yeah. I, and and that's no. that's kind of where I was leading with that. Where were we yeah. at before that? We were no, we were on just, to something else. No, I was gonna I was just gonna go back to your billfish experience. Sure. And how that has now because it seems to me as somebody that grew up in this same area has I have I mean, very little offshore fishing mm -hmm. experience. And mm -hmm. the offshore fishing experience I do is is I mean it's Gulf Coast offshore fishing. Mm -hmm. It's 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 kingfish. It's going out sure, you know, thirty miles and looking for grouper, red yeah. snapper. Yep. But I'm also the guy that if it looks like it could possibly suck, like I don't want to go offshore because no. I don't want to get beat up. No. And so Nobody like that's me. Those. Like I'm a I, I'm a fair weather yeah. offshore guy for mm -hmm. sure. Like I'll go troll for kingfish and twos mm -hmm. or threes because you're moving, but I really don't want to get on a nose anchor when it's fours or fives no. and and try and act like i'm not seasick no. when i'm dropping down i'm not i'm, but, I'm, I'm not on that game yeah either. so so i have very little and i've 
I've never caught a billfish actually in okay. my life, like in any sort of way, well, okay. like on conventional tackle on fly. I've I've never caught a billfish. I've been on a boat a billfish was caught on, but I've never. It was on a vertical jig, so it was one of those kind of fluke right. things. But yeah, it, it was yeah, and um, I thought I was gonna catch a billfish, but it was actually hooked. It wasn't just free jumping. So <laughs> that was a, yeah, but. Um, but how have you taken what you've learned? So here's what I know about bill fishing. Mm-hmm. Very little. It's basically the TV where a guy's on a, a camera, a camera crew's on a boat for 10 days to get 30 minutes of footage <laughs> and they release two fish. Okay? Depending on where you're fishing. Yeah. Yes. And in the same thing, like I just, I see that in ignorance and think, oh, this is awesome. They fished for 30 minutes and they boated, mm-hmm. you know, 10, 10 mm-hmm. bill fish where, it was a week of it can prep. be like that. It was a week of prep. Yeah, but it was a week of preparation, no doubt. and they fought weather, and they yeah. didn't. The camera crew couldn't even film three of the days because the weather was so bad, or whatever else. And I see that, but one of the things that they always talk about, no matter what they're talking about when they're bill fishing, mm-hmm. they always and I hear this is that the look at that fish, look how lit up he is, right? That's what they always talk about. Look how lit up he is. Mm-hmm. So can you explain to us a little bit what that means? Sure. Um, and then also maybe we were talking about this before, so I can kind of help lead into it, but mm-hmm. how you read a fish. Sure. Okay. So I'm like, and the translation of that offshore billfish game now into what you currently do, sure. which is mostly or all basically inshore light tackle and fly. Okay. I'll try to answer all those in a, in yeah, a, yeah, I know it's a lot, but no, I'll try to compress it all. So first thing with bill fishing and all of this will, will, when I wrap it up, it'll kind of all transition into how I'm, I, I use and apply that. Now there is a pile of prep work when it comes to bill fishing, like you've just assumed and when you're fishing how we were fishing and we were tournament fishing, the, your tackle and your bait and your terminal tackle, all of that should be a last, that shouldn't even be a thought in your mind. That should be something that is totally just, your your tackle and your knots and your baits, they should be so dialed that when the moment happens, that should be the last thing. You shouldn't be like, oh, sh- oh, oh my God, my bait wasn't rigged right or yeah. maybe that knot was questionable. No, that, that should... You should be so perfect at tying all of your knots that when I tied a thousand, when I snelled a thousand hooks before we started a marlin season, I knew every one of them was perfect. I I would sit down, bad weather day on the boat, you know, we're not waxing, we're not doing anything, sit down and tie a thousand hooks. I know they're perfect. Put them in a bag, they're good to go. So you said, okay, they film a TV show, you know, might take 10 days to get 30 minutes of footage, depending on where they're fishing and how yeah, good the fishing is. Yeah, and obviously it's different. But sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it it's, could, though. It, it could take that long. It very well could. I have trolled around for days without getting a bite, depending on where we are. Um, but when that moment does happen, and it happens fast, like you'll, you'll, you'll have days where you don't get a bite, or maybe, you know, we're fishing out of Ocean City, and, you know, we fish two days, and we, get, we catch three or four a day, maybe three, which is a decent day up there. Then you go out the next day, you fish the same numbers, maybe some new water moved in, and you get like 20 bites. If you're not ready and you don't have enough baits rigged, you're not going to catch as many as you should there. Let's say you get 20 bites, you got a good crew downstairs, you should maybe catch 15 of those. If you don't have your stuff ready and you don't have a good crew downstairs, you might catch like seven or eight of those, which that's still a really good day, but you get 20 bites, you want to come back flying 15 flags or whatever. Yeah. And how that's kind of transitioned into, let me go back to what you were saying about fish and how to read fish. Um, A lot of times billfish will come up. You asked, you you talked about how fish being lit up. Um, Sailfish are notorious for coming up and kind of being lazy. They'll window shop a lot. They'll come up and they'll swim. They'll be 10 feet behind a bait and they'll just be kind of lazily swimming there. You got to excite that fish. You got to piss him off to get him to bite because you can't just have a ballyhoo in your hand and he comes up behind it, you just can't dump it and expect him to eat it. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. So if a fish comes up and he's he's just kind of window shopping around the spread, maybe he pops up on the, one of the long riggers, and then he pops up on one of the short riggers, and maybe he sees something or, you know, he pops up on one of the teasers and he's lazily looking at it, and then all of a sudden, you know, you start pulling the teaser in, and, the, you know, whatever you're pulling pops in the water, and he all of a sudden he lights up, he flares the sail up, Maybe his peck fins turn blue, and now he's excited. He's in a feeding mode. So 
when that happens, you can pretty much throw a Coke can at him and he's going to swipe at it. He's fired up. He's ready to eat. Blue Marlin are notorious for coming up and they're pretty much ready to roll. You better, you better have everything ready when a Blue Marlin shows up because they're fast, they're aggressive, they break things. Um, yeah. You know, and, and talking about a fish being lit up, billfish and most pelagics for that matter, they have this ability to, to change colors. You kill a dolphin, you pull a, a mahi mahi, not a dolphin people. You pull a mahi mahi out of the water, he's super lit up, beautiful, and then about 10 minutes later, he loses his color. Dull, yeah. He's dull. A, a marlin's the same way. If you if you kill a marlin that's lit up, you put him on the deck, he's going to lose his color. He's going to turn yeah. black. Tuna, I've seen Tuna do similar things. Tuna correct? do similar things, yeah. but tuna will actually keep their color a little bit. Okay. Um, but I've seen marlin come up pitch black. I mean, you, just, you look underneath the dredge, and there's just this pitch black shadow that's down 20 feet. And then you start bringing the dredge up, and then all of a sudden his peck fins will turn electric blue. He slides up behind the dredge, and he's his erratic. His his he's looking up. He's ready to go. Something has excited him. Maybe when you pulled the dredge away from him. So, bill fishing taught me to a read fish because yes, when the fish comes up into the spread, more times than not, we can see him. We can see what kind of behavior he's exhibiting. Is he in a feeding mode? Is he window shopping? Maybe he just comes up and takes a swipe and he's gone. That happens a lot too. Circle back, maybe get another bite out of him. You have to learn when to, we, we were primarily dead bait fishing. And with dead bait fishing, the fish actually has to try and eat the bait before you can dump it. When I say dump it, I mean open the bale and free, free spool him the bait. So if a sailfish comes up and he's brown and he's, he's just kind of back there window shopping, Comes up on the long rigger, he's swimming behind it, and let's say he takes a swipe at it, I dump it, push it back up, he's not there, I reel up, all of a sudden he comes back up behind it, now he's fired up. You're actually waiting for the fish to try and bite the bait, and then you dump it down his throat. So that's part of reading a fish on the rod, Bill Fishing. When teasing a fish, let's say you're on the teaser rod, or you're on the dredge rod, or you're in the bridge and you're teasing a fish. If I'm in the bridge and I'm driving and, and a fish comes up on the, one of the bridge teasers, I have to read what that fish is doing and I have to tell my angler because maybe he can't see it. I have an advantage because I'm higher or the tower guy's telling us where to put it. You have to, it's a dance for sure. You have to tease the fish and tell your angler where to put his bait if he can't see it in relation to the fish to set yourself up for a bite. And you can set that whole scenario up when you have a good angler and a good captain and a good tease guy. You can put the boat in a turn, you give them a clear window of water. The, the mate knows what to do. The captain's teasing the fish perfectly. You can set that whole thing up. So fast forward, now let's go tarpon fishing. When I started tarpon fishing with a fly rod, it was a very bumpy road for me. I, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't really know, like, I knew how to feed fish and I knew, I knew how to feed billfish and stuff like that. And I could certainly feed redfish on the flats, but Tarpon are a special fish, you know, they, they, they want to have it a certain way. And especially in clear water, it can be more difficult with that. So over time, trying to learn how to feed tarpon and, okay, why did this fish bite on this day? And what did I do there that made this fish bite? The bottom line with all fish is they have a very small brain that knows nothing but how to eat, reproduce, and, you know, avoid predators and where to go certain times of year right that which in, is that, which is which is cent, that instinct that they have which yeah. that instinct is is where to go find food yeah. and where to reproduce yeah so that's all in the same category there and avoid predators so those are the three things that a fish has to but do they don't to just survive. migrate for fun no they're migrating because the water temperature is getting cold or they need to go find food for the winter or not for the winter for a, a spawn um you know you look at um you look at boga grand pass for example or Bahia Honda Bridge, or the mouth of the Mississippi when the when the bunker run there, tarpon go to these places to gorge themselves on food to reproduce. Like you go to Boca Grande, they're gorging themselves on shrimp and crabs because they know they're about to go through this rigorous, you know, spawning cycle that they have to do, which is certainly rigorous. So if you have that in mind, the fish are there to reproduce, migrate and avoid uh, or migrate when I say migrate for food and avoid predators. If you if you can understand that, you've you've kind of figured out the game on how to 
how can I say this without not giving too much away here? <laughs> um, you, you can, no, but there's a lot of similarities that I, that I can see between teasing a billfish and feeding a tarp. It's the same thing, but yeah. let me, let me go back. Like if, if, if you look at, uh, Magdalena Bay and you look at Bahia mm -hmm. Honda bridge and a worm hatch or Boca Grand pass in a, in a crab flush, if I go to Magdalena Bay and you know, they're cutting bait on bait balls and you can go catch a hundred striped marlin in a day, they're actively feeding. If I go to Boca Grand Pass and there's a crab flush happening and it's two o'clock in the morning, they're actively feeding. Worm hatch, same thing. The fish are in a feeding mode. There's nothing you can do to probably turn them off. You can rev your engine on top of them and you're still gonna get bites because that mechanism has flipped in their brain. So over time, I started to kind of develop my style of fishing I'm looking for fish in scenarios where, yeah, obviously I would love to find a school of actively feeding tarpon in the middle of the day on a, a Wednesday afternoon out here. It's likely I've not going to happen. I've never seen it. Right. So <laughs> maybe if, you've seen it. I've never seen it. If you, you can't, you can't drive all over the coast looking for that on any no. given day. So you have to basically try and find little bits and pieces of that because a tarpon has to eat. Um, and let, let's just specifically talk about tarpon here and we can go off into redfish and snook and all that if you want. No. <laughs> but if I find if I find a spot where, you know, a tarpon's lazily swimming down the beach, it's high sun, it's clear water, and he's been thrown at by five other boats, tough to get a bite out of that fish. Not saying you can't, it happens every day. Very difficult to get a bite out of that fish. You take that same fish, maybe flip the tide. Maybe the sea breeze kicks up or, or maybe the light gets lower or whatever. And now all of a sudden he's got current blowing in his face and he's starting to think you can, you can see it in their body language, dude. You can see a, you can see a string of tarpon swimming down the beach and they're perfectly just swimming along in a single file line like they do. And maybe an hour later, something happens and the water gets churned up and the wind starts blowing or something. You can see it in their body language. Their peck fins are kind of out. They're, they're, they had, they just, I, I don't know how to describe it. I, yeah, I, and you, you I, have, I to, have a way to describe it, but I'm not going to, cause yeah. I don't necessarily want to yeah, 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 give yeah, everything yeah. away, exactly. but, but they, they, you can definitely see how they change the it's way a mood they change. move through the water. It's a mood change and, and they're looking up, dude. But what I've, here's listening to you, I guess a different way to put it and kind of what I learned. I'm trying to flip the mechanism. Like that's that's basically and that's what, I'm what we're trying, trying to, do. to do. And sometimes they're more apt to flip the mechanism, like you said, when they no doubt. if there's a tide change and they're moving different. No doubt, you can almost tell that. Like there's there's groups of fish that I throw out sometimes that I don't expect. I mean, you should always expect an eat because then you'll miss it if you of don't course. expect it. But if a fish breaks off, I'm kind of surprised. Where you can also tell the difference where you're surprised if it doesn't happen. No doubt. And and you're trying we're. I mean, basically, tarpon fishing dumbed down is it's just trying to flip a fish's mechanism. You're trying to you're trying to you're going to you're trying to turn it from swim mode to eat mode like that. And it's got to be a reaction. You're looking for a reaction bite out of that fish. Yeah. And and so how to do that, you can explain it to somebody all that you want. You but, can't. But you it, can't yeah. do it until you've gone out there. It's like trying to tell someone what it's like to catch a tarpon. I haven't caught a ton of tarpon in my life, mm -hmm. you know, and I've, I've, I've caught a handful. Most of my time out there is a lot of it's spent solo. Sure. So a lot of bad shots, a lot of bad boat position, sure. a lot of, and so that's how you figure it out. And though. so, but being out there, it makes, again, it makes the success that much more rewarding, no doubt. but it also, I'm okay with failure and, and, and people are like, did you have a good day out there? I'm like, yeah. How many did you catch? Nothing. None. I didn't catch anything. But you learn. Maybe like, maybe you learn. Maybe you saw a fish yeah. try to eat your fly, or maybe you saw a fish blow up on a bally or a needlefish or something. And it, whoa, why did he do that? Yeah. Or, yeah. Or or why do they roll in the spot? Or why do why, they exactly. why do they daisy chain on the edge of this bar and not this bar? And, and that is and so. only done through extensive time on the water. And if you this goes back to what I was saying earlier. If you think you're just going to roll out in tarpon season, and I understand everybody doesn't have hours out of a week to go spend on the water. No. But if you if 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 you want to understand a fish on this level, extensive amount of time has to be put into studying the animal. When I say studying the animal, watching his behavior, maybe not throwing at him, maybe going to a spot and just watching fish swim by it and say, "All right, well they turn there 
and then he came over here and he rolled. Uh, they showed me he rolled over there, and now he's going to show up here. Maybe if I put the boat over there, I'll have the best angle of a shot, and the current's pushing this way, and the fly won't be swung, and I won't be stripping on slack line. All of that is done through extensive trial and error and failure. Oh yeah, failure mo is mo most days solo out there. Are we're not? I'm not. I'm, are not a I, success in most people's eyes. But for me, I wouldn't trade it for anything because as long as I as long as I see a fish mm -hmm. and feel like get a e few shots, e and even if I didn't get a shot, hey, m maybe they just turn different with the mm -hmm. tide, or maybe there's another boat that's sitting out maybe there, it was so, a they're bad boat off, traffic so they're bumping day. off, so they're bumping off them, or maybe they're just swimming a new line that mm -hmm. I haven't really right. seen before. Right, they are still fish, they're and, still fish, and they're gonna do what they do, and and you know, being out there solo for a lot of it, you know, I'm not going to get a bunch of fish to hand. I don't really want to mm -hmm. get a ton of fish to hand solo mm -hmm. because I don't really want to set a rod down when mm -hmm. I'm connected to a fish, but, sure. but to connect with one, get a few jumps, pull on them for 10 minutes and then, you know, be able Sit. to pop them off when he gets in the pass. I'm, Sit. I'm fine with that. But, um, you know, and also trying to, you know, I said we weren't going to get into this, but also etiquette wise, I'm, I'm out there for fun mm -hmm. there's a lot of guys out there to make a living and mm -hmm. i'm so i'm not trying to get anyone's way right and i'm not trying to get caught up into you know all the stuff that 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 happens in the day-to-day -day work mm -hmm. relationship and mm -hmm. and but you know trying to stay out of guys way but but also like there's i've been fishing tarpon here for longer than a lot of the guys that are fishing every day out there no doubt i know where the fish are going to swim sure I, I i can find fish mm -hmm. and you know, and I use that because, you know, maybe I'll only fish six days during tarpon yeah. season, but I know where I can go find fish still. And so, um, so kind of as we, as we wrap up, I share the, I guess I can tell that growing up here means something to you. No doubt. Um, and growing up here means something to me. And that's why when I left from this place i couldn't wait to get back because i realized there really is no place like mm. our our peninsula right it's here special um you know we are a peninsula off of a peninsula basically yep. and and so it's it's a special fishery mm -hmm. right you drive five minutes west from here and mm -hmm. you hit the gulf you drive five minutes east from here you hit the bay they might as well be in two completely different states because <laughs> totally they're just totally different fisheries but the fishery is changing. Yep. And whether it's because of matters of conservation, whether mm -hmm. it's matters of uh, population, mm -hmm. whether it's matters of all of the above, I think it's a mixture of all those things. Mm -hmm. The fishing is is different, but no I still think this is one of the best places on earth to go fishing. It's not one of the easiest. No, it's... but I still think it's one of the best places on earth to go fishing because any given day, any time of year you can go and not go that far and have a great day and have a great day and have the opportunity. I mean, whether it's redfish all year, yep. whether it's snook in the, you know, sure. spring, summer and fall, whether it's cobia in mm -hmm. the, you know, in the, in the springtime, mm -hmm. you know, in the late winter, early springtime, mm -hmm. whether it's the tarpon migration that we have for a few months, mm -hmm. it, it really is a great, place and then you partner that with a great community sure and and you know where you grew up too like in 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 uh tarpon springs tarpon springs is a pretty tight-knit community oh, yeah. and a very culture no driven doubt. community as no well doubt. and you know we could do a whole other podcast yeah. on on those sorts of things too and, and we probably will but but that's what i really appreciated about growing up here was mm -hmm. that I grew up in a place that I could ride my bike to the end of the street it's and go special. fishing. Um, I could go get kicked out of places for trespassing. It is special. And it, 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 it truly is a special fishery. And it so, is. Um, yeah, but it's, it's two things. It's it's interesting to see. And we didn't even get into duck hunting. I mean, no. we could, <laughs> that's a whole nother we could, rabbit yeah, we, hole. And so we're going to have to, we just have to say that we're going to do like a part two of this at some point. <laughs> yeah. But but it's interesting for me because in my mind, some things that are so totally different, like bill fishing on a sport fish boat mm -hmm. to tarpon fishing in three feet of water. They're not that different. They're not that different. Mm -hmm. um, you're just, it's, you're, you're doing the same thing. The equipment just looks a little bit different. You're throwing out a pelagic looks. fish. It doesn't have a pointy nose, yeah. but it's, it's the same thing. You're, you're, you're trying to entice a bite out of a fish. That's not really in eating mode. Um, 
and when it all comes together it's it's truly is something special and to do it like you said to do it in our backyard is yeah i mean where i put my boat in the water and where i fish primarily i think as a crow flies i measured it one time i'm like a mile like a mile and a half from where i put my head down at night i mean that's 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 pretty special not a lot of people do that you know yeah no and and you know and i grew up where i could drop the boat down and literally drive Mm -hmm. straight out and it was probably about the same distance to where i'm tarpon fishing so yep um but what i would encourage people to do as we kind of close you have to experience it you do firsthand and the best way to experience that in my opinion unless you live here and you have and mm-hmm. you're doing it and even if you do live here hire hire a guide yep hire a a a, a local captain yep. and and get but don't just hire some random off the internet no. like ask ask um, around go to your local tackle shops talk to people talk to other guides talk yeah. interview them yeah. call 10 guides and talk to all of them and when you step on the boat You'll know right away if it was the right guy. Well, yeah, and and you know, just our fishery still has a lot to offer. And no doubt. Even though it's different, and nothing's like the good old days, right? No. As we kind of wrap things up, it's amazing to me how two things that seem totally different to me, whether it's you know fishing billfish tournaments on a mm-hmm. sport fish to tarpon fishing in three feet of water, mm-hmm. there's not. I mean, there's. There's a lot, there's differences, but they're more similar than they are different. Very similar. Two different spaces, but very similar. And truly, that's something I've never experienced. And you can talk about it all day. Sure. But nothing gives you the experience like going out there and doing it. Same thing with, with, for, with tarpon. Okay. Mm -hmm. Same thing with tarpon. There's nothing that I can tell you. There's nothing that you can tell someone that's never done it that can prepare them for that actual no. moment, for no. seeing what a fish looks like in the water that's about to eat, for the knee knocks that you get at the beginning of the season when yeah. you're laying all your line on top of itself sure. because and you look like you've never thrown a fly before. Yeah. Uh, just because that, like, and like I, you'll literally hook a fish and it'll be on for three seconds and you death grip the line and it breaks and you're yeah. out of breath. You're out of breath. Like you just pulled you on don't it for even an know hour. What happened. You don't know what happened. Like there's nothing that can just like, there's nothing that describes that. No. You just have to go do it. Yeah. And I think that the best way to go do it, if you're not from here or if you're trying to figure it out, the best way to go experience it is to hire a guide and you know ask your local shop hey what are the who are the guides that you deal with because most shops aren't just going to recommend anybody Mm -mm. right they because if they're going to put their name on somebody and and give that recommendation they're going to make sure that it's somebody that they know Mm -hmm. that they trust Mm -hmm. um and that it's a mutually beneficial relationship as well Mm -hmm. but also somebody that like you said it's going to be out there, not put a clock on you, not not make you feel rushed, but you're probably you probably have more anglers that give up on you in oh, terms man. of saying like I'm not give up on you, but like no, I know tap what you're out, saying. Like I'm done for like I can't that's, do anymore. That's, and you're that's like, the biggest part. Yeah, of it. like I can't do anymore. Can we just go redfish? You're like no, yeah, like no. <laughs> I don't. Want that's the biggest part of it. A lot of a lot of being a guide <laughs> is being a, a, a psychiatrist. You yeah, got to pull a coach. Them, you know maybe they just had our, uh, an eat and they totally screwed it up and they trout set yeah. or they broke him off like you said. You got to bring that guy out of the depths. You got to bring him back in the game and boost yeah. his morale and let's keep going. Yeah. No. Absolutely. So. Uh, Thanks for your time, Tommy. No problem, um, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And uh, I guess we'll, I guess we'll set up a part two at some point. Whether we, why not? Uh, I'll sit around and talk when. fishing anytime you guys yeah, want. Yeah, we can talk fishing. We can talk. We can talk duck hunting. We can talk yeah. the whole other passion that you have. Yeah. I mean, truly, and uh, and being a new dad, and and yeah. and how that's uh, that's going to be a challenge this tarpon season. Yeah, we're going to see how that goes, yeah, and how that's kind of changed the, yeah. the the course of your career. No um, and and change i mean it changed your career before your, your kid was even born so no question yeah. <laughs> in a so, big way so yep yeah. so uh thanks for listening guys um and hopefully soon uh this podcast will be sponsored by celsius yeah, right? Sully's, yeah, why not? yeah celsius so or we're duncan gonna, and we're gonna send it to him or duncan or anybody <laughs> anyone that wants to sponsor us we'll even take a pickle sponsor a Tommy. wickles pickle yeah, sponsor I'll take, I'll take any pickles so yeah all right uh see you guys